Hey everybody, welcome to chapter one of uh, Business Statistics. And the first chapter, as you probably guessed, is an intro to Business Statistics. Um, good news is, is most of this stuff in this chapter is just definitional terms. So it's not real crazy and uh, not real difficult to do. So I'll just jump right into it. Uh, the, and what I like about the way these are lined out is it, it kind of maps out how each chapter is going to go. Um, so I'll just kind of go through these terms and I'll try to go through it pretty quick. Um, if you want to listen to it more than once or just read the book uh, to pick up additional stuff, uh, that's up to you. All right, so statistics, I won't read it to you. You can read what it says there on the screen. Um, but in essence, it has to do with how we collect and analyze data, okay, and how we present it for other people to, to see. Um, sometimes uh, we tend to think of statistics as something that people only use in their PhD studies, but we use it in business all the time, okay? Uh, I own a business. And I often track how people uh, view my advertisements uh, and try to use data from that to make decisions about how I will spend my advertising dollars going forward. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, you can see on the screen there's a whole bunch of other examples of how people use business statistics. All right. So know that data just means values assigned to observations um, and that information is anything that's useful facts, right? So that's it. Okay, so here's an example of some data. Uh, here you see somebody's golf scores. Um, and, you know, what we can see is over time, it looks like his golf score is improving. Um, but it's hard to tell much more than that just from this set of data points. Um, analysis, though, uh, could come when we know additional information. For example, uh, here the golfer got a new driver. Um, and then our question would be, well, did the, the driver seem to impact his golfing and make him a better golfer? And certainly at first view, it looks like it might, although we'll learn more throughout the, throughout the course as to how we can really measure that and really tell um, whether or not um, certain items made a difference or not. Okay, two sources of data, two things you need to remember. Um, the, the sources of data or the types of data we can deal with are called primary data and secondary data. Primary data is data that you collect for your own use, uh, and secondary data is data that's already been collected by someone else for some other use that you are then kind of stealing for your own research purposes. A good example of this might be census data, right? Every 10 years, the U.S. government collects data on the number of people that live in, in all around the United States and other demographic information about them. So if we want to do a study on, let's say, uh, race in uh, Graham County, we don't have to go out and survey everybody and find out what race they are. We could just go pull up the already collected data from the census and see how the, the race, uh, how race breaks down in Graham County. So that's an example of secondary data. So here they have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the, big, the big advantage of primary data is it lets you collect exactly what you want to collect. Um, you, know, you know what you're trying to study. So sometimes if you can get just the right data, you can study it well. Okay? The disadvantage is expensive and time consuming. You have to go out and actually collect the data. Um, we're collecting data at the college this year, and they asked for a bunch of us to volunteer to stand in front of Walmart with iPads and uh, ask people if they'd be willing to take a short survey. And then when they did, we'd give them like a free EAC cup or a free EAC phone charger or something like that. So there were costs of time and resources involved. Secondary data is cheaper because somebody else paid for the collection of it and you're just using it. And there's lots of it out there. The problem is you don't have any control over how it was collected and it's not always reliable because you have to trust other people. Um, so that's sort of the difference between primary and secondary data. So here's some ways you can collect primary data. Um, again, I won't read them to you. You can read that. Um, but that's pretty much how we do it. We watch people. That's observation. We experiment or we survey uh, or the questionnaire is still a survey. So here's an example of a survey. You've probably taken many surveys in your life, so none of it will surprise you. Um, but there's an example nonetheless. 
All right, so if you're going to talk about surveying, uh, then you have to talk about the concept of bias. And bias just means um, creating a survey or collecting a survey such a way that it changes um, or, or leads to sp specific answers. And there they give an example of the question that is biased. And you've probably seen these uh, questions on internet surveys. I mean, just, just go on Facebook and you'll see somebody asking a question or, or presenting a fact in such a way uh, that, is, that is biased. Okay. So we've talked about how we collect data. So now let's break data into two main groups. The first is called qualitative data, and the second is called quantitative data. Qualitative, just think of the root word quality. Um, it's about descriptive terms. And there's the examples, marital status, eye color, and so forth. Quantitative data is either counted or measured. So things that are counted might be the number of children per household or the number of errors or defects on a production line. Uh, things that are measured might be weight or height or decibels or voltage, right? It's those sorts of things. And then, once we've decided whether we have qualitative or quantitative data, then we can break them down into subcategories. So qualitative data is either nominal in nature or ordinal, and quantitative data is either interval in nature or ratio in nature. And I'll explain more right here. Okay, so nominal data uh, means nominal is, the root is nom, which is name which means that it's just a arbitrary label, right? So you can't really rank it. Uh, it's interesting to give the example of zip codes because zip codes are actually numbers and you could be tempted to think that that's quantitative data, but the number doesn't really mean anything mathematically, okay? So the Safford zip code of 85546 doesn't mean we can't add that together with the Thatcher zip code and come up with a Thatcher plus Safford zip code. It just it doesn't mean anything. So instead, it's just a name for a place, uh, given an assigned number in this case. But we could do the same thing with people's names uh, or with a color. So that's what nominal means. Arbitrary labels, no ranking. Ordinal data can be ranked. Okay, It can be put in an order. So the example they give is your education level. Um, whether you have a high school diploma or a doctorate degree, um, we can rank those things. We know that each represents a more time in school, as an example. Um, the downside is, though, is you can't really tell anything about what it means by the ranking. Like, you can't say that a master's degree is twice as much of a college degree as a bachelor's degree or something like that. There's no real mathematical significance other than the rank can kind of tell us which one is more or less. So those are the two uh, qualitative types of data. And then there's the two quantitative, interval and racial ratio. So interval data uh, has meaningful differences between it. The example they give are calendar years. But there's no true zero point. And what that means is you, there's no like, remember that a true zero point means like the absence of something. So for calendar years, even if you were in the year zero, that wouldn't mean the absence of years. It would just mean you were at the beginning of how they started numbering them now, right? It would still be a year. As opposed to ratio, which has meaningful differences between the data, and a true zero point. So if somebody has an income of zero dollars, that literally means they had made no money, right? So those are the four types. It's a little confusing now, but as you work with it, it'll become clearer. Another way we can look at data is time series versus cross-sectional. So time series, the values correspond to measurements taken over a range of time. Cross-sectional would be data collected at a single time period, but across a number of subjects. So if I wanted to look at how uh, well my business did, um, in sales, and I looked at my same business over 10 years, that would be time series data. Whereas if I looked at my business compared to 10 other businesses this year, that would be cross-sectional data. There they kind of demonstrate it with a, 
of the drawing, you can see this, that I won't try to read it to you. You can see that time series information is often displayed with a bar graph, right? So we can show the percentage of unemployment rates, for example, from year to year. And cross-sectional data is often displayed with a bar graph, so you can compare one item to the other. Now you could show, you know, you could show the cross-sectional with a line graph, it just wouldn't be as clear. Okay, so um, we're going to, in this course, we're going to talk about two types or two, I keep telling you that, two categories, right? But so another way we can categorize statistics is as either descriptive or inferential. So descriptive statistics, which will be the first part of this course, that'll talk about the way we collect and, and display data. Uh, and then the second part, we'll talk about inferential statistics. Um, that's where we can sort of take a sample and then make inferences or guesses about the larger population uh, based on the sample. I think guess is probably too uncertain of a term. Inference is a better, uh, better term. Um, educated guesses about what the population or the larger group will be like based on the smaller group. So some terms you'll need to know um, as we get more into these things. Uh, is that population represents all of the possible subjects that could be studied. So the population of the United States is all people in the United States uh, versus the sample, which is a subset or a portion of the population um, that we would pull out uh, in order to, to make inferences about the whole population. The reason we do that is that sometimes it's just too expensive. Uh, you can't survey every single person in the United States. Uh, the United States does it for their census, right? And they try to, and, it, and it's incredibly expensive. Um, so that's why it becomes important for us to be able to look at samples and make some inference about the broader population. Another couple terms you need to know. Um, any characteristic about a population is called a parameter, and any characteristic about a sample is called a statistic, and that's where the term statistics, uh, like the name of the class, comes from. All right, so like I said, inferential statistics is making statements about a population by examining sample results. Um, I didn't say it that way. Here I just read what the book people said. Um, so there's their example. It's not really an example. It's still just describing it, but nonetheless, it says it's an example. Okay, so here's their example. Assume an unknown average weight per box of cereal on a popu uh, in the population. Um, is 18 ounces. So then you select a random sample of cereal boxes and then you calculate the average of the sample. Then you can use inferential statistics to determine the probability uh, that the actual population is about that same size and conclude that it's probably actually a little bit more because the average of our sample was 18.2. Um, this matters because um, you know, there's laws that say if you're going to say there's 18 ounces worth of cereal in that box, then there better be 18 ounces of cereal in that box. Otherwise, you are lying to people. So, but you also don't want to have to, you know, overfill each box in order to ensure you're being compliant. If you're putting an extra half ounce in every box and you're making millions of boxes, that could really, really damage your business. So being able to use, to take a sample, you know, every once in a while grab a box off the line and weigh it, and get a good estimate of about how much is in the total is 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 in the average box uh, in the population it can be really important to kind of making or breaking a business. All right, so the last thing they want to talk about in this chapter is ethics and statistics. Um, I bet you have realized by now that you can use data to lie to people, uh, especially if you just sound smart about it. People just kind of believe you. Um, so you have to be careful with how you use it. Um, some terms that might help you is a biased sample. That's a sample that doesn't represent the population. People do this all the time. Um, you know, they'll, they'll go around. Uh, you've probably seen like these where they walk around college campuses and ask kids questions and then make videos of them answering it and looking like idiots. And they, they use that to prove that Everybody in college is a liberal, everybody at college is a conservative, everybody at the college is stupid, or, or whatever. 
And what they do is they handpick the respondents, right? They don't show you the videos of all the people who are smart. They handpick two or three of the people who look stupid and then use it. That's called a bias sample. Another way people misuse statistics is by changing the graph of scales. Um, this is a really good example, actually, that's up on the screen right now, where the unemployment rate, if you look at these, looks vastly different uh, just because just by changing the scale uh, of the two things, of uh, the two uh, the two graphs. And so, right, it says the exact same thing, but probably the one on the left really is more meaningful to us because a, an unemployment rate shift from 5% up to almost 10% is really significant. Uh, but the one on the right makes it look like it's not really significant at all. So that's another way people misuse statistics. And that's the end of the chapter. Um, I hope this wasn't too painful. I tried to make it quick. Uh, in the future, sometimes we'll have more difficult concepts and we'll probably not be able to get away with a 16-minute lecture video. But happy chapter one, and uh, good luck in the rest of the course.